Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Works. Okay. Um, yeah. First of all, thanks so much to um, Daniel and Ryan and Raza and everyone involved in organizing this symposium. I think it's really important uh, to bring this group of people together, and uh, it's also the first time that this group of people formally comes together. So there has been, of course, over many years and often through Facebook, there have been a lot of conversations. But uh, this is kind of an important moment, I think, for everyone involved. So. Um, and um, so the title of my talk is kind of a play a game with words, it's in part Mariological. So Mariology is based on parts, but in part also means that it's not entirely Mariological, right? It's kind of partially Mariological. Um, so yeah, let's talk about uh, parts. That's, um, I think that's an image I just produced for the last uh, competition uh, I did for the Central Art Platform in Korea. And uh, I just want to start uh, my uh, talk, in a way, with um, just kind of provoking this uh, with this work, which is something I produced uh, four, five years ago together with uh, my colleagues in the DRL at the AA. And so, obviously, this work seems almost from an entirely different uh, paradigm, right? So it's kind of this transition from the model on the left to the model on the right, and it couldn't be visually more different, and um, it almost seems like a reduced model. Um, on the right, right? So it's the difference between this extremely high res, extremely continuous kind of uh, generative project uh, and then uh, this recent work of uh, the office. Uh, this is a multifamily home uh, back in Belgium, uh, which is made of, of just uh, one single uh, piece on three different scales aggregated together. So this work is visually incredibly different, but um, I made this a custom, I made a few cheesy custom uh, memes. So this one is saying it's the same thing, it's just a bunch of uh, lines. So um, in my opinion, basically all the work that I'm doing with the office is uh, highly repetitive. It's a serial repetition of the same idea, which is just the organization of a single line uh, in space. And although there is a visual difference between those projects, they're actually investigating the same agenda. And somehow that was interesting. It's something I, in a way, and I may be wrong, but it's something I realized after reading uh, Daniel, his book, that this kind of uh, mariological attitude or the mariological way of reading things allows you to look uh, at things not just as the mere surface or as the object, but try to understand them as a set of relationships. And so this allows um, Daniel, for example, to write uh, a very uh, complex book about this image, which many people have um, misjudged before as, as an incredibly reductive model, while well, actually it, uh, it is a very complex model. And uh, so in preparation for this talk, I was kind of reading uh, two books at the same time. So I read uh, Daniel's book and also a uh, kind of basic uh, history book uh, by Jacques Lucan uh, about composition and non-composition. There's some kind of resonance between these things because the book on the right is really talking about kind of disciplinary history of architecture and its um, research in the part of all uh, relationships. And uh, it's also important to mention uh, the fact, again, the title of In Part Mariological. Um, in my work, I'm actually not using Mariology as a mathematical method or as um, even uh, a design method. It's almost more, um, I would say, kind of attitude or kind of stressing the importance of uh, a certain interest in a specific part to whole relationship. And you can trace this back quite far in the uh, Deleuze and Quattari in um, uh, the smooth and the striated. They already mentioned the word of dom uh, domesticating parts and not imposing uh, force on parts and, and giving a certain agency to parts, and then Mandela Landa articulates this further. And then uh, the moment that I kind of picked up on the term Mariology is from uh, the book uh, The Democracy of Objects by Levi Bryant, where he really established almost has a kind of political uh, vision on um, part to whole relationships. And he introduces this concept called strange Mariology, which is, um, I think, the most complex form of Mariology and the one that maybe as a generation we are looking for. And that's a Mariology where basically it's a part to whole relationship where uh, the part and the whole are democratically on the same level, they have the same importance and they are resonating, as uh, to use uh, Daniel's word, they're resonating uh, with each other. So the part has an existence outside of the whole and the whole is not dependent on the part, they are embedded uh, in each other. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that when you have this kind of Mariological reading then and you're just purely interested in um, part to whole uh, relationships, 
that uh, I'm just going to time myself because this is going to end up bad anyway. So. Uh, or if someone else can come, I got you. You you go you go. Okay. Anyway, so um, so the the interesting thing is this, these are some things actually uh, also from Daniel which I found really striking. Again, this meriological reading which allows you to look at this nine square grid, but then actually understand it either as a top-down relationship, right? This is a superimposition of parts that generates grid, but it could also be a bottom-up uh, product of the grid, right? So the same visual output uh, could actually be ideologically completely different. It could also be a combinatorial system based on new shapes, right? And uh, so the, the, the main question I want to pick up from uh, reading Daniel's book is really this question, uh, what is, in a way, the smallest part uh, if you are engaging in part of whole relationships, what should we decide on as the smallest part? And um, Hilbesheimer apparently decided on the room as the smallest unit because that's the first unit that is composed of um, industrially prefabricated elements and then that's the first moment where composition happens and then this seems to become uh, the part to be redistributed. Now, why is this important? Why is this new? It seems very bizarre that a group of young people organize a conference to talk about part to whole relationships, which is one of the most you know, almost, it's so old, like, why is this important, you know, is, is there really nothing more radical, uh, I mean, yeah. so I, I, I'm going to advance kind of two arguments which are mixed with each other, so one is more architectural argument, and the other one is more a logistical uh, tech argument, and I'm going to be very repetitive, a lot of things uh, Casey, Daniel, um, Raza, and uh, Jose mentioned are going to come back, right? Um, so, first of all, right now there is a particular um, I think we're at a particularly difficult moment uh, in the kind of legacy of uh, what you could call the digital project in architecture. So after three decades of research at this moment now, where the majority of um, the big architecture schools and academic programs have actually dismissed um, the digital agenda, and are talking about something, the po what they call post-digital, so the idea that there's a certain maturity in the discourse which allows you to not anymore talk about the digital as a theory or as a thing, but we just talk only anymore about the object and um, we use the, the tools freely to, to you know, make objects and then we, we just talk about these kind of things. That's also combined with a provocation by uh, Neil Leach, which says, is there actually such a thing as digital architecture, right? And so Neil, of course, says, okay, there's no such thing as digital architecture because basically these are computerized processes, right? They're uh, CNC controlled, they're robotic, they can be scripted but the output they generate is not per se digital, right? So you can as well make this Maria statue there on the left, or you can uh, mill like, uh, you know, combinatorial uh, aggregation or something. But in the end, as a material organization, those two products are exactly the same. They are not digital. Digital only exists in the process, and in the output it doesn't exist. Which would be a great argument for um, the object, uh, the people interested in objects, because then this is a good reason to say, look, Dismiss the process, it doesn't matter, it's just the final product and the material organization of the final product. And to a certain extent, um, there's a lot of um, reason to, to agree with this. Uh, for example, if you look at 3D printing, uh, you can easily argue that these two material organizations are exactly the same. Okay, one has a different process, but at the end of the day, when you look at the objects, uh, they, their meaning, their part of all relationships, their material organization is exactly the same. Um, so that's the post-digital, right? L'objet uh, is ça. That's the kind of, at the same time, uh, I would also say that's actually, for the moment, the, really the, the struggle with uh, the meta-narrative. So, so the struggle, once we are just confined to discussing the qualities of these objects and how we relate to those things, that's also a, the moment where there's absolutely no more meta-narrative, no more belief, no more kind of horizon of uh, where to go with the discourse. And then if you get really cynical, uh, you can turn to Rem Kulhas, and then um, the same surface that we register here that eliminates the objects then also becomes an architectural surface that is one centimeter thin. Everything above that surface is out of our hands. It's a discrete assembly of assets, which is run by HVAC engineers, and the architects are confined to the surface that is one centimeter thin. Okay, and uh, then um, you can either be postmodern and then, in a way, uh, be cynical and apathic about this condition uh, and decide to really surrender to the object and to the surface and run with it. Or, and it's quite sad we missed uh, Timotheus uh, Vermeul and his uh, talk today, or you can um, pick up on some kind of spirit which is in the air today, 
which is uh, the idea that there is some kind of return to commitment. And that's something that happens, I think, as a general cultural conditions. We see this in, um, see this in Bernie Sanders in the United States, in politics, and uh, Jeremy Corbyn in London. We see this in a lot of people actively starting to question uh, post-capitalism, starts, starts starting to talk again back about ideas of commitment. You see this in, for example, uh, the previous presentation by Jose Sanchez, which has a very clear commitment to, uh, to specific issues, right? You also see this in the, the kind of um, uh, yeah, large amount of new manifestos that are, that are getting published online by diverse groups of people. So you have um, the Accelerationist Manifesto, which was published, you have the Xeno Feminist um, Manifesto, which was published, and um, also the Meta Modernist Manifesto, which we unfortunately missed today. So then you could argue, okay, if there is a return to commitment and if you want to avoid the object and you somehow want to investigate uh, the potential of, of that digital architecture, you could also, again, with this cheesy meme, uh, say that actually digital architecture could be kind of meta-modern uh, condition, right? And uh, again, just a citation from uh, Vermeulen uh, that the, the, the basic difference is that uh, postmodern irony would be related to apathy and then uh, in a kind of metamodern irony, you would um, there is a certain desire, although you know uh, you have a cynical attitude to your desire. Yeah? And so this is uh, for me a modernism, right? Modernism is uh, the kind of you could say it's uh, the kind of um, unconstrained belief and absolute enthusiasm in a, the future or in a, or in a kind of goal and target, uh, uh, typical from the twenties. That's like this dog running after the ball, being very enthusiastic although he will not achieve anything by running after the ball, right? And so a uh, metamodernist would be a slightly more cynical version of the same dog. He would still run after the ball, but he would know that, I mean, in the end, it wouldn't necessarily give him anything, right? Um, so it's interesting then also in that case to question what would actually then be uh, the that meta-narrative. Um, and uh, to start this kind of discussion, this is just a series of um, quite uh, superficial provocations, but I always like those because they generate uh, discussions, right? So the first provocation is actually, uh, I would say, it's um, accusing everyone from the past three decades of uh, digital research of mereological nihilism, which means that they don't recognize uh, parts. They basically treat, uh, they only think in a holistic fashion. And as a result of that, uh, they can actually be accused of being analog. So although it's a digital project, it's actually fundamentally an analog project. And there is this difference between, um, of course, analog and digital. So uh, analog is basically a continuous, smooth um, signal, and digital is a discretized, um, um, non-smooth system. Right? And uh, then this is, again, uh, Daniel can explain this much better, in, uh, explains it much better in his book. So he, he talks about the fact that Greg Lin's uh, famous curve in animate form actually has no part to whole relationships within it and it's com completely called a uh, linkage uh, hole, I think. Uh, and, uh, it's completely controlled from the exterior, just as also Jose Sanchez mentioned in this lecture. And then this results in a series of work where uh, there are literally no parts. Of course, there are physically parts, but these parts are completely, der uh, completely derivated from uh, the whole, right? So that then results in a series of panelization projects. And this kind of... Um, Slices, I call them, they, they happen in different directions. So this is kind of two directions of slices. That's one direction, maybe of a slice as a panel. But then also 3D printing is fundamentally uh, analog uh, as well. It is also neurologically nihilist because that's also just a slice of code. And there's no difference between uh, stacking laser cut um, slices on top of each other or printing. It's a continuous deposition of uh, matter. And of course, these projects are great, right? Uh, it's not, this is just purely about the analog output. I mean, Hans Meyer and Dillenberg, the, the process they developed to generate um, these objects is, of course, digital and is, uh, without any doubt, much more advanced than anything I've ever done with a computer. So yeah, that, that, that's not to say, uh, it's, it's not to dismiss uh, this work in any way. And then also, this is one of the most confusing ones. This is also fundamentally an analog project. So that's a um, robotically assembled um, structure. It's made of discrete pieces. Right? Okay, it's made of pieces. They're actually not discrete because every uh, combination, every joint between those pieces is unique. So it's again a panelization uh, project, exactly the same. Uh, and then uh, there's, I mean, I'm going to skip this a little bit uh, for my time. But so then essentially, uh, this is some work um, We've been doing at the Bartlett uh, past two years on 3D printing. It's again uh, digitally a discrete process, 
So it's um, a small piece of toolpath that starts as a serialized unit that can combine into a complex uh, spatial toolpath. But then again, although the final output uh, is quite nice, it's essentially, again, okay, an analog uh, product, right? So to get back then to this question in the beginning, if you choose a part, what is then the smallest part? And uh, the entry point for me there was um, thinking about something I call uh, architectural materials. Uh, and it's uh, inspired by a concept of uh, digital materials. So digital materials are, um, in a way, proposed or invented by Neil Gershenfeld at MIT. And they are materials that are able to establish objects that are also physically digital. So it's actually, as a response to Lee Leach, his question, can you actually, is there something as an object that is not analog in a physical space, but is actually digital? So according to Neil Gershenfeld, this exists. Um, so for example, this table is, uh, you could consider that as a, a digital, a physically digital object, because it's made of uh, pieces, uh, discrete pieces which always have a limited set of connections, so they're digital connections, are they connected or not, and it's completely aligned with uh, the digital process uh, that is sent to And then the materials on the right are also kind of more mechanical version of uh, the same voxels, uh, etc. And uh, the important part here is that they always have this limited connection set and the part is the final connection set. And um, the other example by an endorsement are uh, Legos, so Legos are also digital, digital materials. And uh, basically, the basic way how to understand the digital material is that it has a limited connection possibility, which allows, I mean, it's basically zero or one, right? Or uh, an analog material always has a continuously differentiated uh, intersection. So what I basically tried to do the past year is develop this architectural material, so they're not, they don't share all the properties of digital materials. They are basically relatively large-scale uh, discrete pieces with a, a limited uh, connection scheme. And then this fundamentally changes, uh, as Jose was saying, that idea of um, serial production and the seriality. So if this is an example of serial production, where there's a um, kind of typological difference between the parts, one of my uh, students in the department, Ivan Tepperi, made this kind of brilliant comparison between what he calls the meriological mass production versus modernist mass production. So in modernist mass production, you will differentiate uh, by type uh, the different pieces. And then in meriological mass production, there is just a single piece, a single bit of matter, which then establishes what Jose would call patterns, or it could also be understood as types, right? Uh, so it's literally a pixel which aggregates and then is uh, essentially as an object has no meaning at all content. It's just, it's just a piece, right? And uh, so that kind of uh, gives rise to this idea of the accelerated uh, domino, uh, the fact that uh, there's a kind of, um, uh, you, you really shift the system uh, just to the interaction of uh, parts. Accelerated structuralism, so that's a kind of weird, um, weird uh, detournement of, of this whole uh, project where um, we're actually looking, uh, in a way, looking back at the 1970s, that kind of highlight of modernism to uh, accelerate uh, that idea of prefabricated discrete pieces into an entirely new domain. So we are kind of looking at this model in the 70s rather than the first model. And now to go really, really, really meta, uh, I developed the meta box. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the, the meta box uh, basically allows us to kind of uh, construct a meta narrative uh, on the architectural effects of uh, that meriological model for the domino. So, so this is uh, the meta box. Yeah. Uh, so the meta box uh, consists of uh, points, surfaces, and uh, volume. Yeah, points, mass, lines, and surfaces. And then you can use the meta box to uh, describe the entire history of architecture. So that, that's kind of everything that has happened. So everything before uh, 1910, uh, you could roughly, on a meta level, argue was based on mass, and on kind of uh, in a way carving out uh, mass. And then there's a kind of brief moment, uh, you could argue between the 1970s and 1990s, that follows a similar model. And then uh, between 2012 until now in um, Los Angeles, there's also a similar model. So I call this a uh, primo, uh, pre-modernist POMO and HLO, which is a hardware oriented ontology. And so that has a kind of spatial paradigm associated with mass, which basically means that it's all about separating the interior from the exterior, essentially, right? So it's drawing, it's removing the object from the kind of ecology or from the larger landscape. And then mole, uh, the, the definition of mole, uh, let's say between 1910 and 1970, is based on the surfaces of the meta box. 
and the surface is trying to establish a continuity with the exterior between basically um, nature and uh, the human world, right? So it's kind of fusing uh, inside and outside, really radically uh, integrating, establishing a continuity. And that's actually very important. So the project of continuity actually, I would argue, starts with Van Dus' work and the futurists, which are talking about um, integrating inside and outside. And then uh, between uh, the kind of uh, liquids, I messed up the numbers there. Okay, the liquid surface, which is uh, between 1990 and 2000 now, yeah, is basically not anything different from the modern surface. It's also um, just basically liquefying these two surfaces of the meta box and continuing the project of continuity. And then the last, uh, the last step in the meta box. So if you remove, you always go to the more basic level of the box would then basically be the mirrorological project where you just have uh, points, right? And then the lines are the relations uh, between those points. Uh, but essentially, I would argue that then the, um, uh, the kind of uh, this uh, meta-modernist project also ties into the larger meta-narrative of architecture consciously trying to create uh, a continuity and a kind of dissolving of the room or the enclosure versus the project that is based on, on mass. So you could actually construct um, uh, a meta narrative arguing that there is actually not necessarily a difference between the fundamental mission of uh, the digital project with uh, maybe the modernist, uh, the modernist project. This is a slightly more cheesy version of the same diagram. So, mass, surface, liquefied surface, and uh, point and line uh, connections. Right? And then this is kind of funny because then um, the line has always been kind of the dirty child in architectural history. The line has never had any role uh, in architecture. Uh, so um, uh, now it's really kind of the end moment maybe of this mission, uh, this kind of meta-narrative of architectural invention that it's all about. Uh, all about. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this. Um, and then uh, th these are just some uh, uh, small samples of projects of uh, my office where we're looking at the impact of uh, having no more surface, no more topology, no more mass, but just aggregations of lines which are establishing uh, spatial conditions. So architecture is just basically lines, parts, etc. That's um, student work uh, from um, Elliot, uh, also from Bartlett, um, where there's a, a, a serial, in a way, kind of serial version of uh, that linear uh, project. And then this also radically shifts our attitude to uh, fabrication. So when Mario Carpo was arguing that architects uh, in the kind of um, wake of the digital would become, again, not Albertian, but would become a kind of Brunelleschi type, uh, or even a medieval type of craftsman, uh, like these two guys here. And then everything associated with being a craftsman and not an architect, right? That was kind of the model Mario Carpo was uh, arguing for in the alphabet and algorithm, uh, that the Albertian paradigm is over. And I would argue that it's not over, it has just started. So we're definitely not craftsmen. It's all about uh, being removed uh, from craft. It's not about small scale interaction with material and kind of you know thinking about these nice things like pottery. I mean, that's a hobby. It shouldn't be architecture. And um, so, what we actually go for, I argue, for is a full automation of, of uh, the assembly of those parts, which allows for a full removal of the building site and a complete kind of model of um, the architect uh, and um, yeah, and it will make kind of completion of the Albertian uh, paradigm, a total skip of uh, the building site and a pure digital organization of matter. And just to, uh, hope, I think Ryan is not taking the time, actually. I am taking the time. You are? Yeah, you're, you're okay. Taking, just go okay, so, um, uh, and then uh, ju just briefly some projects, student projects that are currently ongoing in the market, where you're looking at the premise of uh, full automation, so instead of uh, basically 3D printing, we use robots to quickly assemble uh, serial parts and then establish an entire, um, let's say, meriological system around those parts, including, for example, structural analysis. Like this is a series of patterns between a serial repeated parts, and through the surface overlap between two pieces, we're able to evaluate whether those connections are stronger or less strong, which then allows you to um, start to distribute uh, those pieces and make decisions based on the, on the strength. And then that process is completely aligned with um, the physical world. And uh, basically the robot uh, places one tile and then uh, you could, I mean the second tile has to be a random next addition uh, to the tile. Or you could, as a human, you could also place another uh, tile. 
and then um, there is kind of yeah, a complete alignment between every computation step uh, and uh, every fabrication step, similar to what uh, Casey Wren was talking about um, with, um, um, with his uh, 3D printed uh, painting interaction. Uh, these are some of the weird kind of forms coming out of uh, the script. And then uh, these are some architectural speculations where you know, this kind of um, assembly of patterns start to form uh, different arrangements of codes, highly, kind of highly heterogeneous and um, living up to the vision. This I'm just going to skip through because all of this work you can find online anyway, but that's just work from the office looking at um, discrete uh, aggregations. So this work is gradually becoming more and more based on uh, a single piece. So all of these ones have no intersections, they just uh, assemblies of a kind of kit uh, of parts, and so that's the kind of last work, which is 278 discrete pieces, which are then organized in a highly specific, highly uh, spatially differentiated um, uh, building. So, and, and that's really, I think, this is really the provocation. Like, I think that that image for me has been the most important image in uh, the past two years, because that's really uh, talking about. Um, yeah, the kind of radically, I think, new idea for uh, prefabrication. And uh, it's, the piece is very simple, so you have a, a line, you have an L-shape, and then the L-shape allows you to, without intersection, to translate uh, between these two directions. And it has this male-female connection between it. Uh, there's a lot of structural issues, which I'm not going to go into now. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, I think I was in time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh